Hello and welcome back to another Sunday Conversation. Last week we were discussing the framework of our life and how Hebrews tells us that by faith, we recognize that the worlds were framed by the word of God. That means they're supported and upheld. Consider what we thought about last week with regard to if the foundations be destroyed, what then can the righteous do? The righteous don't need to worry about the destruction of the foundation. The righteous need to stand upon it and live in it. Here's the verse that I want to take you to this week. Habakkuk, the second chapter, the fourth verse. Behold the proud, his soul is not upright within him, but the just. Now recognize here we're speaking about two different individuals. One person is a proud person. The other is a just person. Now I don't know about you or which one you would choose to be, but I would choose just. I want to be justified, not by anything that I've done, but I want to be justified by his grace I want to be justified by His mercy. My personal definition for justification is simply this. It's just as if I'd never sinned. I certainly don't want to be thought of in God's eyes as a proud person. Why? Because throughout the Word of God, it says the Lord resists the proud. If there's anyone that I don't want against me, it's God Himself. And He has said that of the things that He hates in this world, one of them is is a proud look. Peter said, the Lord resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. I would much rather receive his grace than I would his resistance. So here in Habakkuk, we're looking at two individuals, the proud person whose soul is not upright and the just person. And here's what the Bible says, Habakkuk 2 and 4, the just shall live by his faith. How are we going to live? You know, there's certain things that are essential in order for me to live. Food, shelter, water. And there's certain amounts of time that I can go without those things and not really worry about whether or not I'm going to continue to exist. But for example, if you take water away from me for three days, then I have a high chance of dying. If you take food away from me, for an extended period of time, I might feel like I'm dying, but eventually over time, malnourishment would set in and I would have health issues. If you take shelter away from me, I'm fine until the elements turn so contrary that I wouldn't be able to survive. I could sleep outside most nights in San Antonio and not be worried, but if I would have chosen to sleep outside on a night when it was below zero, I might not have been able to get up in the morning. But here, what the Bible's talking about is your soul, that part of you that was spoken by God in the beginning. And it says the one thing that you need to survive is faith. The just shall live by faith. Faith is everything. Without faith, the Bible says, it is impossible to please God. Without faith, you have no access to salvation. Ephesians, it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. It is the gift of God that no man can boast. Faith is the basis of everything. So how does God build your life? First, he gave his life so that you could have life. That's the foundation. But everything after that foundation comes with faith. If you're going to see the best in this life, you have to have faith in the God who promised that you could have it. That's what Habakkuk is saying. By faith is how the just shall live. How does God build your family? By faith. Deuteronomy 6, 6 and 7. This is a very important verse to understand God's responsibility towards fathers and parents in society. Deuteronomy 6, 6 and 7, it says, And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk with them when they sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. Now, if we have faith in God's word, we understand that it is imperative that we share that faith and primarily with the next generation. 
Deuteronomy 6 and 7. And you shall teach them diligently. What does diligently mean? Diligently does not mean that you do it occasionally. Diligently means that you do it daily. You know what I do diligently? I eat breakfast diligently. As a matter of fact, if I skip breakfast, I'm grumpy. I don't know, maybe you drink coffee diligently or there's certain people you call diligently. But diligent deeds are the things that you do on such a regular basis, it's irregular when you skip them. Let me ask you this. Do you pray with your children diligently? Do you do it so often that when you don't do it, they ask for it? Do you discuss the things of this world and apply God's word to them for your children diligently? Whether you know it or not, your children, no matter what age they are, they're impacted by the culture that we live in. But do you speak to them that the Bible says God hasn't given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of sound mind? Do you help them understand why the word of God is the answer to the things that they're facing in this time? You see, this verse in Deuteronomy chapter 6 is a verse that God gave to the fathers of Israel just before he gave them the promised land. This is what they have been striving for for 40 years. And in the book of Deuteronomy, God is telling them, here's how you're going to keep the land from generation to generation. In many ways, we can look at the world that we live in and suggest that the United States is somewhat of a modern day promised land. And if we are going to keep this promised land from generation to generation, it is not going to be through an educational system. It's not going to be through a Sunday school system. It's not going to be through a great youth group or anything that some organization does for young people. It's going to come first and foremost in the home. And it's going to become a thing that is essential for you as a parent to pass down to your children. That's why the word of God said, you teach them diligently. You teach them when you talk with them and sit in your house. Let me ask you something. How much of your home time is spent digitally disconnected from the people that you're physically living with? You need to have some device-free time in your home where you and your children learn to have a conversation. You ask them questions about the world that they're living in. How are things going in your home? How are things going in your school? How are things going with your friends? And you ask them on such a consistent basis that you understand and can interpret when their behavior changes so that you'll know how to impact their life as a parent, where to give them advice, where to offer them counsel, where to let them know that you're constantly there to pray and support them in their hour of need. Talk with them when you sit in your home. Also, Deuteronomy says, when you walk by the way, what does that mean? When you go through your daily life, don't take God out of the day-to-day -day things that are happening in your life. Explain to your children when God answers prayer. If you have a great day at the office, connect God's blessings to that great day. If you're walking through a difficult time, connect God's promise to be a deliverer to that difficult time. Why? Because when your children have a good day, you want them to give God glory. And when they have a hard day, you want them to put their faith in God. But they won't do it unless you do it. This is a simple verse to read, but I promise you it's not that easy to impact. I strive to do it on a daily basis and many days find myself falling short because the world we live in is such a busy world. It's such a hurried place. There's so many things to do. There's so many things that you've got to accomplish. And at the end of it all, you fall in bed and you're exhausted. And just a few minutes later, you feel like the alarm clock rings. But these are the things that are important to God. This is how he builds your life. This is how he builds your family, by faith and by his word. It says when you lie down and when you rise up. Basically, it's saying there isn't a time that isn't good to teach your children the word of God or connect them to what God is doing in the world today. How does he build your life? By faith in his word. How does he build your family? By faith in his word. How did he build the church? 1 Timothy 3 and 15. Here's what the Bible says. Paul is writing to Timothy. He says, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, 
which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of truth. Think about that. Here, Paul tells Timothy, it's not just a structure, it's the house of God. Now, I don't know about you, but there's a way that you should conduct yourself when you go to someone's house. When I went to my grandmother's house as a child, I knew which furniture was for sitting and I knew which furniture was for staring. I don't know if you had a grandmother like mine, but there were certain pieces of furniture you just looked at, you couldn't sit in or touch. And it was something that we accepted because it was her house. So here Paul is saying to the people of the church, I'm writing this to you so that you'll know how you should behave when you go to the church because it's not your house, it's God's house. And not only is it God's house, but it serves a purpose. Now listen to this, it's the pillar and it's the ground of truth. It is the anchor. You know, here in the Texas Gulf Coast, what they'll do whenever there's a hurricane that's gonna come ashore, They'll take boats out into the water and they will anchor them to concrete pillars that are poured down into the ground because they know that if the boat stays in port, it's going to get knocked around with all the wind and it's going to get damaged up against the dock. But if they put it out in the water and they just use an anchor as the ground that's being turned over by the storm moves, then the anchor's going to move and the boat won't be there when they come back. But if they go out and they tie the boat to a concrete post that is grounded into the earth, it really doesn't matter what happens, that boat's going to be right where they left it. Well, that's exactly the picture that Paul is painting when he says the church is the pillar. It's the thing that the world is tied to that no matter how tumultuous and how chaotic it gets, it's the one place we can all come back to. Think about this. What do people do anytime there's a tragedy? The Twin Towers fall. A horrific and tragic day for those of us who remember 9-11. Impacted millions of people's lives. Where did they turn? The church. A tragedy occurs. There's a mass shooting. There's a high fatality incident. What do people post on Instagram? Praying for fill in the blank. There's a storm somewhere in the world. Prayers are extended. Why? Because even if they don't admit it, we are the ground. We are the place that they come back to connect to when the winds and the waves and the storms of life are blowing. So if that's our role, how are we going to fulfill it? First, we fulfill it by faith in God's word. And then we fulfill it by doing what Jesus said. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. That's the qualifier. Oftentimes we love each other so long as that relationship is beneficial to us. But what is it to love like Jesus loved? Jesus loved us when we weren't right. The Bible says while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Can you love somebody when they're not right? Can you look at somebody in their wrong state of mind and in their wrong behavior and still extend to them the grace and mercy and love that would pull them closer to God instead of the judgment and wrath that pushes them further from God? Not only did he not love us when we weren't right, he loved us while we were growing. Look at how he treated the disciples. Peter, for example, James and John. These individuals walked with him for three years and many times on many occasions when he would finish sharing some of the most profound truths that the Bible contains in the Proverbs, they would look at him and they would say, Master, we don't understand. Do you know how frustrated I would be if when I shared the word of God with my congregation and felt like I had done all that I could to share and encourage them, share with them and encourage them with the word of God, they said, we don't understand. My patience level couldn't tolerate much of that. But Jesus patiently loved them while they were growing in understanding. When they were wrong, he just pointed them right. He didn't beat them right. When they needed help, he gave them the help that they needed. 
Are you willing to love other believers that way? How often do we see it in church where somebody who's been going to church for a long time would much rather cast judgment on somebody who just started going to church because they don't know as much as I do? I've heard the conversation more times than I can count. A young Christian gets excited because they read their Bible. And then somebody will say, well, how many chapters did you read? You need to read more. I look at it like I did when I was a parent. For the very first time, my daughter Hannah had come home. You know, she grew. She's sitting in a high chair. We're teaching her to eat. My wife and I, if we could have videotaped ourselves, we would have looked absurd because all we would do is cheer and clap every time this little baby took a spoon and put it in a bowl and stuck it in her mouth. If she did it the right way or was attempting to do it the right way, oh, yay, you did it, you did it, you did it. Why? Because we wanted to encourage more good behavior. But it begins by encouraging. And you can't encourage others if you don't love them first. If there's anything that the world needs from the church right now, more than ever, it's love. Because the love of God is the fuel that allows the light of God to shine. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, with all of your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. I pray that you were encouraged by the conversation that we had today, and I want to encourage you to join us again next week as we continue to talk about how to build this building, the living church of Jesus Christ here on the earth for His glory. In a day when Israel is fighting for its very survival, we need to wake up and vote in leaders that can help us return to being a great nation under God. If you want to know how things are going to turn out in Israel, in America, or in your own home, read the Word. It is the most prophetic book you will read, written by an author who works all things together for your good. For your gift of any amount, we want to send you the Bible-packed resource, Why Christians Should Support Israel, and a vial of anointing oil you can use in prayer. For your generous gift of $200 or more, we will send you an entire bundle of Israel-related gifts that include an authentic Jerusalem shofar made in Israel, a Jerusalem stone tile and stand with the Jewish prayer, the Shema, a beautiful home blessing artwork in Hebrew, and the 65th commemorative ornament. To claim these precious resources, call the number on your screen or visit jhm.org slash defend Israel. Hi, I'm Kendall Hagee. Thank you for connecting with us today. God bless you, and we pray that you'll join us again next week.